Good. Boy, I'm glad that you guys made it here today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this great day. Thank you for the opportunity to be together, to worship you from our hearts, with our minds, and from our souls. I pray that you help us, Lord, as we open your word, that you might speak to our hearts, that we as your sheep would be fed, that you might help us to understand what it is you'd have us to do and how you'd have us to live. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming, for stepping so low as to become one of us and to live a perfect life, to show us how it's to live, and then dying for our sin. We're so grateful, Lord, and this is the day that you've made, and I'm going to rejoice. Thank you, Lord. Be with us today. Be with our hearts and minds in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're back in the book of Luke. We're going to talk about healing and humility. Jesus is going to have an event where he's going to teach by demonstrating, as he always did. I always find it's better, instead of just have words, but to have examples. Um, it's a much better thing for me. I tend to be more of a kinetic person. Uh, the highlight passage for today is in Luke 14, 11. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So as we look through the passage, um, that's going to be the main theme of all of it, actually. To go back a couple of weeks, we were talking as we looked at Jesus' teaching about the kingdom of God. You guys remember what the kingdom of God is? Anywhere where God is king. That's right. The kingdom of God is anywhere where God is king. In your heart, in your life, hopefully in, in your home, in your job, uh, while you're driving. That might be a little more difficult for some of you. But wherever God is king is the kingdom of God. And so we talked about what that is, and he warned the Pharisees to repent. And he says, you know, uh, there are things that happen in life, and we're all going to die at some point in time. We all have an expiration date that the Lord knows about, and we don't, and we don't get to pick it. But when it happens, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to be right with the Lord or to just live our life on our own. And the Lord says, well, if you think that these tragic events that happen to people, you think they're any worse a person than anyone else? Of course not. But unless you likewise repent, you will all perish in the same way. And Jesus says, don't worry about other people. Make sure that you'll have your own act together. And he talks about bearing fruit unto repentance, about how in our lives there should be things coming out of our lives that give glory to God, that exhibit the kingdom of God. And then he heals a woman who's completely and totally bent over and heals her in front of everyone on the Sabbath, which uh, as far as the religious community was concerned is a big no-no. But Jesus didn't care because he didn't live his life for the praise of people. He lived his life for his father. And that's what we should do. And sometimes we get caught up with the opinions of other people because we want people to like us. We want to be approved and honored and we get tied up. But anyway, so we looked at that two weeks ago. Last week, we talked about the kingdom of God and about the kingdom of God is not something that is seen. It's something that's within us if Christ sits upon the throne of our hearts. When God's in control of you, then you're living in the kingdom of God. And then this week, we're going to talk about healing and humility. So I've only prepared uh, 14 verses for this message because I tend to go long. And then I prepared another chunk afterwards if I have time. So we'll get to it. That's like, that's like dessert and coffee if you feel like it. You know, we'll get there. Just read the passage as it stands, verse 1 in chapter 14 of Luke. Now it happened as he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, that they watched him closely. And behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus answering spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? But they kept silent. And he took him and he healed him and he let him go. And he answered them saying, which of you having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him regarding these things. So he told a parable to those who were invited that when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, when you're invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. 
and he who invited you and him come and say to you, give this place to this man. And then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. And then you will have glory in the presence of all those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Then he also said to him who invited him, when you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. And when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So Jesus, the ultimate party crasher, <laughs> telling everybody what they should do. If you're going to give a party or if you're going to attend a party, what you're supposed to do. So let's go over the healing. It says, now it happened when in the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees, he went to eat bread on the Sabbath. They watched him closely. I want you to notice that every time Jesus was invited out to eat, he went. I know I do. <laughs> Every time Jesus was invited to go out, he went. Now, this is one of the rulers of the Pharisees, okay? This is not someone who finds him in favor, and he realizes that there might be some trouble or it might even be a setup. But Jesus says, okay, and he goes. Jesus is not afraid of conflict, is he? In fact, I think he says enough to offend everyone, especially in this passage as we look at it. Because we live in such a society that is so politically correct and so concerned that we might hurt someone's feelings. By the way, do you know you're not responsible for someone else's feelings? Yes. You're not responsible for someone else's feelings. You're responsible for what you say, but you're not responsible for how they feel. In the same way, I'm not responsible for whether you catch the ball that I pitch to you. I may pitch a ball to you, and it might be rather fast. And you have a choice. You can catch it with your mitt, which I would prefer you would. You can catch it with your bare hand, which is a little more risque, or you could catch it with your face. <laughs> your feelings will have everything to do with how you catch it, not how I pitch it. Do you understand? So... Jesus is pitching, and he goes to eat bread on the Sabbath, but they watched him closely. It's on the Sabbath. It's kind of like today, like today. Hey, pastor, why don't you come to our house for dinner? Sure, no problem. I will say yes. He goes to, with them on the Sabbath, and yet they watched him closely. This means they fastidiously examined his behavior, everything about what he did, where he sat, who he looked at. You know what it is when someone's giving you that evil eye? When they're looking at you and they're looking for mistakes, and certainly they'll find them, right? Yeah. You look close enough. I know you've already assessed my wardrobe and decided how I shouldn't have worn this shirt. <laughs> or at least my wife has. Because it doesn't fit my neck. But anyway, you know what it is when people give you that evil eye. I almost like want to say that just to get it out of the way. In Proverbs 23, verses 6 to 8, it says this in the original King James, which was written in 1611, which has a very strange sound to it. Eat thou not the bread of him who hath an evil eye. Isn't that interesting? Neither desire thou his dainty meats. I love the King James. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but... His heart is not with thee. The morsel which thou hast eaten shalt thou vomit up and lose thy sweet words. In other words, if you sit at somebody's table who's a miser, 
be careful that you don't eat too much because he's counting the price of every forkful. That makes sense? Yeah. That's a little more understandable. I understand. That was from another passage. But when somebody's examining you to find fault, they, they almost always will, right? The funny thing is the opposite is true. When you, when you look for the good in people, you will surely find it as well. But these guys were looking for a problem. So you realize that he's being very carefully examined. And this is the ruler, one of the rulers of the Pharisees. So this is like going over a congressman's house or something. This is a very, it's a big deal, okay? So you get that look. I, babies will give it to you, man. They will give it to you. Uh, the, the Greeks have invented this really nice thing to keep away evil eyes. It's called an evil eye. So I don't know if that's true. But they are looking at him very closely to find a problem. So be careful whenever you go to somebody's house and you're invited over to eat because you don't know what they're looking for. Number two, and behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. Now, for those of you who don't have a medical degree, or understand this word, dropsy does not mean you commonly drop things. That's what, that's what some people think it is. And some of you may have that, but that's not dropsy. Dropsy is what you might call elephantitis or edema. It is when the body, when the cells ex absorb excessive water in your body. Uh, it's usually the first signs that your uh, kidneys are going or your liver. Sometimes it's a heart involvement. Sometimes it's a bug. A bug actually can give you edema. That's what it's called. If you get a bug bite and you're allergic. Uh, this is the only time that Dr. Luke uses this word in all of the scriptures. So uh, uh, this is like a trivia word. What is dropsy? You can, uh, you'll know. It, it's excessive retention of water due to heart, liver, kidney problems, which I already said. I don't know why I type these things up. But it can be fatal. It can be fatal. And obviously, if your heart or your lungs absorb that amount of liquid, um, it, it can mean death. So this is a big deal. But you have to wonder, why was this guy invited to this meal? We've seen the Pharisees do this before. You know, it's, it's them and all their buddies in, in all of their regalia. And then there's someone who does not seem to fit the pattern. So I'll give you a few hints as to why he's there. A fully working death star? It's a trap, okay? This guy is put there on the Sabbath by them as a trap because they knew that Jesus would have compassion on him and heal him. That's a heck of a way to be tempted, isn't it? Yeah. I know, I'm going to tempt Jesus. I'm going to put somebody with a need in front of him. You watch, he's going to help him. That's the kind of way that Jesus was tempted. That's bizarre. So, by the way, everything that we go through is a test, isn't it? Everything is a test. How you're doing today, how you're doing, whether you made it here or not, ta-da, that's a big deal. Uh, how you're going to handle today, whether you're going to walk away and actually know anything more than you did when you came. These are all tests. Everything's a test. Whether you're able to get out of your house without killing your mate. That, that's a test. <laughs> I did. My wife is alive. So, in verse 3, And Jesus, answering, spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? I love the way Jesus answers them even though they didn't ask any questions. He answered their thoughts. I wonder if he's going to do it. I think he's, he's going to do it. He's looking, he noticed him. Oh, he's going over to him. I think he's going to do it. And Jesus answers them. They didn't say a word. But Jesus answers them. I love that. I love that when I find little things in the scripture I didn't see before. Jesus was not breaking any commandment, by the way. He asked them, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? But they kept silent. Now, you know what their opinion is. You're not supposed to do anything on the Sabbath. I mean, a, like a, a serious bowel movement would just be way out. So <laughs> they kept silent. And he took him and he healed him and he let him go. 
this is an interesting story. He was invited. He came to eat. All these important people, Jesus didn't care. He wasn't intimidated. He goes, and here's one guy that does not look like he belongs with the others. Why did Jesus let him go if he was not an invited guest? Was he not an invited guest? No. I'll give you an, uh, an idea. He was a plant. He was planted there so that Jesus would heal him on the Sabbath and they would have something against him. And this isn't the first time this has happened. They're not listening they're not having him over to teach. They're not having him over to question him about anything. They're there to trap him. And he stood up to the test and he didn't care what they thought and he did. And he heals the guy like that's no big deal. It's given this much word. He heals him and lets him go because the Pharisees were done with him. And Jesus was done with him too, but in another way. Jesus was never afraid of what those around him might think of him. He just did what his father told him to do, and he let people decide what to do with it. Amen. That's what it is to live in freedom. Freedom of fear, where you don't have to worry about what anybody says, because you know if your heavenly father approves of what you do, then it doesn't matter what other people say. And you will have to deal with it, and you should put your mitt up. But ultimately, we're here to serve the Lord, aren't we? And when you do that, you don't have to worry about anybody else. You just do what the Lord would have you do. It says here in Matthew 12, 9 to 14. Now, when he had departed from there, he went into their synagogue. This is another time when Jesus was tempted to heal on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? You see, they asked him this time that they might accuse him. And then he said to them, what man is there among you who has a sheep? If it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not lay hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. Now that, that's a cruel thing for a guy who's got a withered hand, he's paralyzed. And he stretched it out and it was restored as whole as the other, which means there was a whole lot of work that had to be done. And then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. You know why they wanted to destroy him? Because he did things that they couldn't do. He had a real relationship with God and he did things that they could never do. And so they were intimidated. They were afraid of him because they would lose their phony baloney power. And it's phony baloney because it was all fake. <coughs> Another passage here, <coughs> John chapter 5, beginning in verse 16. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him. Backstory, Jesus walks up to the pool of Bethesda and he sees this man who's paralyzed. He's been there for 38 years waiting for the stirring of the water. Because it's fabled that the stirring of this water was an angel coming and touching the water and the first one in gets healed. It's like, you know, the first one that arrived gets a free DVD player or something. And so he laid there for 38 years, a guy who was lame. He wasn't able to walk. He was paralyzed. And Jesus said, do you want to be made whole? And he said, well, <laughs> essentially he says, it'll never happen. There's nobody here to help me. I can't move. Somebody always gets in there before me and it'll never happen. So Jesus could have said, so what are you hanging around here for 38 years? Isn't there a better place for you to hang out and there a better place for you to be? And yet he doesn't do that. He says, pick up your mat and walk. I think he said it just like that. Stop your whining. You got your healing, go. Nothing to see here. You still here? And he does. And he picks up his mat, which is a little, a little thing, like a little blanket you'd put on the beach. And he walks. The Pharisees catch him walking with it and saying, hey, you can't be walking with that. That's like moving on the Sabbath. And he goes, well, the guy who healed me told me I should pick up my mat and walk. So that's what I did. 
good principle. When Jesus tells you to do something, do it, even though everyone else tells you you shouldn't. And then that is why they hated him. And that's why they wanted to, to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered and said to them, my father has been working until now. And I have been working. Did you ever think of that? If you go back to Genesis, it says God created all the world in six days and on the seventh day, he rested. And the very next verse explains what that means. He ceased from all the creating that he was doing. That's what resting means. In other words, God made it all and he said, it's good. Except for man being alone, that's not so good. And it was good. And God stopped all the creating that he was doing. He started a new work. But God is working even to today, isn't he? Is he working in your life? Are you not a different person than you were last year, I hope? Absolutely. And God is still working to this very day, and so Jesus does as well. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but he also said that God was his father, making himself equal to God. You know, you'll find people who will say, Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, everybody else seemed to understand what he was saying. They said, now we want to kill you for real. Not just because you're healing a guy and telling him to walk with his mat, but because you make yourself equal with God. That's exactly what he did. And since Jesus never sinned, it must be true. Then Jesus answered them and said, most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Jesus said, God the Father shows me everything because he loves me. Has not Jesus shown you everything? Why? Because he loves you. Jesus did all these things because he loves you. And it's written down and preserved over the ages so that we can read it in our leisure. It's a tremendous blessing. In verse 5, And then they answered him, saying, and he answered them, saying, which of you, having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit, will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? He's using different animals, but the same reason. And they could not answer him regarding these things. I love how Jesus keeps giving them answers, even though they're saying nothing. They said nothing, and he answered them. And then when he said, well, what do you guys think? You think it's, it's okay to heal on the Sabbath? And they said nothing. So Jesus answered their nothingness. <laughs> he said, listen, if you had an animal, an animal that might be pulling your plow or an animal that might be carrying you or carrying your burden, wouldn't you pull them out? If your car got caught in the snow today, wouldn't you pull it out? Yep. I, I bet you'd come in here and ask a few big hefty guys in here to help push it, especially if you parked in the back because grass and snow, it could happen. Although I tested it yesterday, it seems to be okay. But if you had an animal that fell into a pit, and very often they would fall into wells because they weren't, you know, like the big walled things that we understand. They were just openings in the ground that they would cover. They would fall in. And in fact, I actually have pictures of ones that actually fell in. There was a cow that fell in, and there was a... Uh, I was able to read all these stories because I had plenty of time on my hands. So they actually fell in a pit. They fell in a well. And Jesus said, if you had an animal like that and it fell in, wouldn't you lift it out? How much more a person? He's appealing to their reason, right? You know, Jesus isn't standing up and yelling and screaming and pointing at him saying, you idiots, why don't you get this? Like, you and I might do that. Well, I might do that. You probably wouldn't, but I would. But Jesus is appealing to their reason. He's saying, think about this, guys. If you had an animal that fell in a pit, wouldn't you pull him out on a Sabbath? Of course you would. Well, how much more important is a human being, especially one with dropsy, which is back then it was a, it was a death sentence. They actually have herbal cures and all kinds of other things for it now. But why, why isn't this person important to you? 
In Psalm 40, verses 1 and 2, it's interesting, references this David, one of his Psalms. He's saying, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. It's a wonderful proclamation. I hope you guys all know that, that the Lord reached down and pulled you out of some nasty pit or some swamp, you know, uh, of wherever it was that you were. I know I was. And the Lord pulled me up and put my feet on a rock. People are important. And when they're stuck, they need help. Amen. And Jesus didn't care what day it was. That was a priority. That was important. That was something he was willing to do. Proverbs 29, 25 says, the fear of man brings a snare but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Jesus didn't care what other people thought. He did what his father wanted him to do. And isn't that awesome? When you can do that, that takes a great deal of faith, doesn't it? To trust God instead of trusting the people that are giving you the evil eye, maybe. You guys spent time with your families, I trust, during Christmas and maybe some friends during New Year's and you know, you might find some people that don't approve of everything you do. <laughs> so what? Are you, is God good with it? That's the most important question. And when that's good, then nothing else bothers you, trust me. You can live in that little bubble, which is I'm good with God and you know, you have a problem and I refuse to make it mine. I'm sorry if I belabor this point. But we live in a world where you can't even identify a, a, a man and a woman. Don't, don't you dare call me that. I identify as a hammer. <laughs> I think an automatic machine gun is a hole punch. But it's certainly more than that, isn't it? So, sorry, I, I go off, forgive me. It's about rules over relationship. When you are a legalist, it's about rules over a relationship. And sometimes you'll be breaking people's rules if you show love or you show grace or you have a stranger over your home and maybe the rest of the people in your home go, who's this guy? Oh, it's Pastor Dave. He's weird. <laughs> so, yeah, that's okay. You may offend people if you have me over your house. But I hope that relationship is more important to you than rules. It's about rules over reason. You see, Jesus tried to reason with them. Hey, listen, if you had an animal, wouldn't you take care of the animal? Yeah, you would. Well, what about a person? They don't get it. Because they're legalists. And it's about appearance over authenticity. It's not about being real. It's about how you appear. What a heck of a life that is to live in fear of everyone's opinion. I would never do this job. As you can tell, I don't care. Or I care very little. Anyway, Jesus speaks on humility. Verse 7. So he told a parable to those who were invited, those who were at this meal on the Sabbath. And he noted how they chose the best places. You, you can imagine opening the doors to your house and having everyone talking outside and suddenly the master of the feast says, come on in guys, food's ready. And all these guys like jamming through the door trying to get to the best seats. See, that's why we have all the seats that are the same, except for some. So, he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, when you were invited by anyone to a wedding feast... Do not sit down in the best place, lest one who is more honorable than you be invited by him, and he who invited you and him come and say to you, give place to this man. And then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. You know what it's like when everyone has to sit down at the dining room table, and if you're not, if you're not the person that lives there, if you're not the one calling the shots, or if you haven't put little tents in their places so that people know where they're going, you know the rush and the confusion of, well, where do I sit? 
these guys all went to the head table, you know, and they were both trying to jam into the, I, I can see the whole battle, this whole rush of people in their regalia, in their robes and, and their self-righteous lookingness running and try, I, that's not even real English, but anyway, you get the idea, you get the picture. These guys are rushing for the places of prominence. It's like musical chairs. You guys play musical chairs? Musical chairs is brutal, man. <laughs> but that's what these guys were doing. It's like they were playing musical chairs and they were rushing for the best places. And of course, you know how musical chairs, there's, there's one chair missing for all the people that you have and you go in a circle typically or an oval or a square or you, know, you just spin in one place looking at the one chair that you have your eye on. <laughs> there's all different ways to cheat. But he says, why, do you, why are you playing musical chairs? It's, it's like a do or die. And it's like life or death when you play musical chairs. <laughs> At least I thought it was. Okay. You know, you know you, you're jumping on a chair at the same time as somebody else. And, you know, you don't even think of the embarrassment. You just don't care. I'm, I'm not moving. Well, it's my chair. I'm not moving. Well, I'm not moving. You know. This is what we've been shown. This is how we've been shown. If you take something, it's then you will float to the top of the gene pool, you will get promoted and be a CEO and you will work for rich people. Is it not the American way? Is it not simple Darwinian logic? I almost got musical chairs, teaching our kids that shoving and sh not sharing makes you a winner. You ever think about what, what you're teaching your kids with musical chairs? Oh, well, it's just an innocent game, Pastor Dave. Yeah, I realize that. I don't know about you, but apparently I'm scarred by it, so. <laughs> Jesus said you shouldn't do that. When it comes time to sit down at a, at a big table like a wedding feast, don't look to be at the cool kid's table, the head table. Don't look to do that. Sit in a low place. Be humble. And it's a different thing for us to do that, isn't it? I almost got a tattoo like this, which right next to it said, only the strong survive. That was like my mantra when I was 17 years old and I was in the military and I had a few beers. I almost got this tattoo. It would have been different, not on my face or anything, so you wouldn't have known. But that's what this world teaches. That's what we've been taught. Jesus is saying, you guys, you religious elite who should know better, don't have any sense of the presence of God in this room when you do that. You're just looking out for you. It's all about you. Life is all about you and about how others see you. See, because jockeying for the position right next to the master of the banquet was a position of honor. Do you know who sat next to Jesus when he ate at the Last Supper? There were two. John, because he was the youngest, I think, and he needed protection so he didn't get, you know, decrepit from all the other disciples. And Judas. That's why in the book of John, when it talks about this whole conversation and John leans upon the breast of Jesus and he says, who is it, Lord, that's going to betray you? And he says, it's the one who dips into the bowl with me. And at that moment, Jesus dipped into the bowl with the person on the other side of him, who was Judas Iscariot. And it says, Satan entered him, which is a scary, scary thought. And he went out and it was night. This is what we're taught. Jesus is teaching us something different. And so if it feels uncomfortable and it sounds like, wow, I didn't realize that. Don't worry about it. I didn't know either. But this is kind of what we do. You know, you're down to one chair, the music's playing, and you're just waiting, you know, and you're dancing around and, you know, well, wait, I don't have an optimum angle here. I got to turn the chair and, you know, oh, well, I'll step over that. You know, I got it. Okay, I'm going to push you over. You see, because all the fun and games is all about whether I'm going to sit in the chair or you're going to sit in the chair. And so it's the battle is on. And there, and that's what happens to the chair. And that's what happens everywhere. 
And yet this is the kind of mentality that we have to live with. And if you're not careful, you'll begin to think that way. So in Philippians 2, 3 to 8, we have this great example how Jesus shows us, not just tells us the teaching, but shows us. In, in chapter 2, verses 3 to 8 in Philippians, it says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. You could put a period there and, and just memorize that. Don't let anything, nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, that's called humility, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant, that's a slave, by the way, but a voluntary one, and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man, which is super humiliating for God to do, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to death on the cross. Jesus isn't just teaching us with his words, he's showing us by his actions how we're to be. And as a Christian, this should be a part of our lives, shouldn't it? Humility. Humility, where I'm, it's not just all about me, it's about you and me. In fact, I think about you before I think about me. And th that kind of humility isn't that you don't think of yourself as less, but you think of yourself less and you consider other people more. You can do that when God meets your greatest need. You can do that when the God of heaven says you're good because my son died for you and I love you. Certainly out of that resource should come something. This is called the incarnation. Another verse that demonstrates that is John 13 verses one to five. This is the last supper as we know it. Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come and that he should depart from this world to the father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end, or he loved them to the fullest extent. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and he was going to God, rose from supper, he laid aside his garments, he took a towel and girded himself, and after that, he poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel in which he was girded. This is the incarnation, God with us. And Jesus stooped. It's an interesting statement. He took off his garments, just like he took off being God. And he put on a towel, which leaves you very exposed. He became a man and he stooped low, which he did by being born in a manger. And he washed the disciples' feet. That's exactly the ministry of Jesus. Do you know that? The beautiful thing is he rises up after he's over and he puts back on his clothes, which is a picture of the resurrection. It's exactly what Jesus did. That is the incarnation. Jesus says we should take the lowest place and he takes the lowest place. We are now the incarnation of Jesus to the world. Do you realize that? God with us is the spirit of God in the believer. Do you feel the pressure? <laughs> do, do people know that there's something radically different about you? Do they know that Man, there's something about your life because I, I got to have it. What is it? That should be the way it's going on in our lives. So Jesus says, but when you are invited, you go and sit down in the lowest place so that when he who invites you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. 
And then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. You see, that's the thing they were all seeking. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but whoever humbles himself will be exalted. A good definition of humility we find here in Romans chapter 12, verse 3. Paul saying, for I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For instance, I am not a good long distance runner. I can say that with all assurance of faith. I am not the tallest person in this church. I know because I have to call Carl, get down the toilet paper. <laughs> I know many, many, many things. There are some things I can do and there are some things that I can't. Humility is knowing your weaknesses. Humility is knowing that you're not nearly as important as you wish other people thought you were. That's humility. So don't take the high place. Don't take the position of power, of recognition. Don't take it because it should never be taken. It should always be given, right? You know, respect is not something you can ever squeeze out of somebody. Right. Like submission. You can never squeeze that out of somebody. Honor. You can never squeeze that out of somebody. Or a compliment. Or a real apology. Oh, you didn't know that? You owe me an apology. I'm sorry. Feel better? No. Why not? Because it wasn't real. Well, do you think you can squeeze one out? There's a lot of things you can squeeze, but you can't squeeze out an apology. This is what honor is. It's a state of being morally upright, honest, noble, virtuous, and magnanimous. The perception of such a state when you show honor towards someone else. It is veneration of someone, usually for being morally upright and or competent. That's what honor is. That's the glory he refers to. If you sit in a low place, that's the number one way that you're going to be able to get honor. You're not going to get honor because you insist upon it or because you stole a seat or because you were the only person left after the, you know, after the game. You get invited to that place. You don't ever take it. The way of honor is humility. If we're willing to humble ourselves, God will lift us up in due time, it says in the book of James. But if we lift ourselves up, know you're going to get knocked down and know who does it. It's God. Because he loves you. And he doesn't want you to have a false perception of really what's going on in your life. Then he also said to him who invited him, because see, Jesus was telling all of them, don't seek the number one places to sit. So he's telling them how to arrive at a place. Now he's going to tell this guy how he should have a party. The nerve. <laughs> then he also said to him who invited him, when you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, or rich neighbors. Who should I invite then? lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, maimed, lame, and blind, and you will be blessed. It seems to me the guy with dropsy was one of those in that category, and he was excused. But you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you shall... <laughs> for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. You see, if you want to guarantee that somebody isn't going to pay you back, find people who can't pay you back. You want to bless people and you want to show goodness and kindness and grace, do it to people who can't pay you back because then there's no question of your motives. Right? That's why I give Christmas presents in July. I wish I did. It was a good idea. <laughs> so when you're going to give a party, don't invite all of these people and your rich neighbors like, oh, my neighbor just got a brand new built-in pool. I'm inviting them over to my house for dinner. I'll tell you what, I remember getting a pool when I was a kid, and I never had so many friends. There's never a question of somebody's heart if they give of their surplus and you have nothing. There's, there's no payback. And I like to let people know that, you know, 
there's no strings attached. I think that's important. And so when you're going to throw a feast, a festival, when you're going to really have a blowout, invite those people who can't pay you back. If you really want to have honor, if you really want to be humble, if you really want people to, you know, think well of you, this is what you should do. Imagine how that went over like a lead balloon in that room. Mark 12, 37, the second half of the verse says, and the common people heard him gladly. Everything he said to the Pharisees stung, but everything he said to the common man was just, they heard him gladly. Because it's like, you know, somebody's finally speaking up for us. I, I love that about Jesus. And I'm going to leave it right there. And we'll leave the rest for next week. It's a, same bat time, <laughs> same bat channel. Lord willing, we'll be right here. Ask the worship team to come up. Maybe you're like that guy with dropsy. Maybe you need the Lord to touch you. And by the way, that's how he healed him. He touched him. Maybe you need the Lord Jesus to touch you in some way. He can do it today if you let him and if you ask him. If any of you are interested in that, you can speak to myself. You can speak to Carl. You can speak to any of the deacons. We would be glad to pray with you, pray over you. Whatever it is that you think that your needs are, we're here to serve you. Jesus tells us that we should think of others above ourselves, that we should be humble. And we shouldn't lift ourselves up. And when we do that, the Lord then can lift us up because then we become trustworthy to be able to handle it. I pray that the Lord might minister to each one of our hearts today.